Good morning. If Isaiah was living in uh, New England when he wrote the 40th chapter of his prophecy, he might have written it this way. All flesh is grass and all of its beauty is like the leaves on the trees. The grass withers, the leaves change color, the leaves fall when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are as grass or as the leaves. The grass withers, the leaves turn color and fall. But the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray together. Father, in this most beautiful time of the year here in New England, and this year especially, the colors seem especially brilliant, bright after so many years of not much at all. We're so thankful for the beauty that you've built into this creation, even as the colors signify coming the end of the, the season of growth and life and the, the enter to winter and its dormancy. Lord, though the, the world changes around us, summer, spring, fall, and winter, the word of the Lord is forever. The word of the Lord stands forever. You are our rock. Your word is our rock. And because of that, we come to worship you every week. Because of that, we speak of you. Lord, we dedicate this time to you and to your glory and us to your service, strengthened by the word that never fails. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us. We're partway through the month of October, which I confess is my favorite time of year. And uh, right now those colors are getting ever more brilliant. I'm looking forward to taking a drive out to see them before they start to fall in earnest in just a little time. Thanks for joining us for the online ministry of the First Congregational Church of Wyndham. I welcome you on Facebook. I welcome you on YouTube. I hope that you will sign in and let people know that you're there. They rejoice. You encourage one another. When people get to see that you're there because they know who they're getting to worship with. The people that come and gather in church here on Sunday, they're so happy to see each other and be together. And it's just that simple act of saying, hi, I'm here, um, sharing a thought, greeting, is a real encouragement to the people who are there with you. So I hope that you will plan to do that. I do. I'm going to invite you every week because we continue to meet in person at 1030. So while this is beginning, if you're joining us on Sunday morning, while this is beginning, we're actually beginning our worship time in the sanctuary and and uh, we'll be praying for this us, you know, <laughs> here as you're listening. And so, but I do want to encourage you to come out in person. There is nothing that that can substitute for the body of Christ together as you see each other's eyes. And behind our masks, you can't see each other's smiles so well, but you can see the brightness in their eyes. Um, but as we have a chance to see each other, talk together, listen together. So I do invite you to come. Uh, step out in trust and faith and hope um, and, uh, and come join your church family in worship. But we're going to continue to be here for you if you can't and you're not able to. And I'm, I'm very thankful to be able to do that. You do know that these different messages continue on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. And so there, if there's one that has been particularly helpful to you, or perhaps there's one that you would like to share with somebody, it's very easy to do that. You just direct them to the pages and, uh, and they can find it. I also always like to encourage you to take advantage of the playlists. We don't try to sing on these programs. Um, that's just not really feasible. But it's good to have the songs. And often we're singing most of the same songs that I have on the playlists. And they are to help direct us to the Lord. They supplement and enhance, hopefully, the teaching that we have, making us think about the themes and trying to understand Scripture better and helping us to lift up our hearts in praise. So I do encourage you to uh, take advantage of the playlists. And while you're there on YouTube, I'd love it if you would subscribe to the channel. That ends up enabling us to communicate a little bit more out to the community that we are here and uh, some of the things that we are doing. Well, it's shoebox time. And uh, this is one of the flyers on the back. It has the uh, little tag that you can clip out to put on your box. It's time to pack a box or two or three 
Bring It for Church, the third Sunday of November, and uh, we will send it off for the ministry of Samaritan's Purse as they share the love of Jesus with children around the world. And uh, each box blesses a lot more than one child because very often one child will get a box and then they'll share the things that are in it with some of their friends who may not have gotten a box. But there's also a little booklet that talks about the world's greatest adventure, and that is coming to know Jesus. Because Christmas and uh, Operation Christmas Child is not just about gifts, certainly not about Santa around the world. It's about coming to know Jesus, God's greatest gift. And so as you give, as you share, you have a wonderful opportunity to spread the love of Jesus around the world. I would remind you that our October mission is the work of our brother Daoud over in West Africa. And we are continuing to collect for the well project, the next well he's working on. Thank you. People have been generous towards that already. But October is the month that we specifically set aside for his ongoing Bible translation and community ministry. And so that's a very important thing. As I've said before, you have enabled us to give $3,000 a year every year since our group of churches came together seven or eight years ago uh, to help. Bible Translate to help provide for his people. And so that is for the month of October. The easiest way to do that, well, I, I guess it depends on what you think is easy. For some of you, the easiest way to do that is to get out your checkbook and write a check and put it in the mail. And I hope you will. Otherwise, you can go on our Facebook page. There is, a, you can go to the PayPal link, but there's also another one. It doesn't have the name Vanco on it, but you'll see where it says to giving. It's a very, very simple, secure way for you to give online. And while you're there, you can also give your regular giving. Uh, without your regular giving throughout the year, we're not able to continue to do what we do. And if you feel that the Lord is blessing you, I, I hope that you will share that blessing in helping the word of Christ go out for other people. This morning, I have two passages to read as I do. Because I like to make this more than just a talk time. I, li I like for us to um, really be able to draw near to the Lord in his word, in his prayer, in prayer, and in thought. And so the, the first passage this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 25. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Who brings them out, their host, by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. He's thinking of the stars and the constellation in the night sky. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths will faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But all of those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And then Paul in Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits for eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that this whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the, our adoption as sons, 
our redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Psalm 46. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human rulers who cannot save. Their spirit departs. They return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. The grass withers. The flowers fade. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. He remains faithful forever. Again, blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Let's pray together. <laughs> Father, help us to settle our minds, our hearts, our spirits as we come now before you. The world is so full of noise around us. It is so full of distraction. It's so full of anger and, and violence and hostility. It is full of war. It is full of disease and pestilence, even beyond this COVID disaster. It is full of brokenness. It is full of loss. Lord, so many people propose solutions for these things. They propose medical solutions and technological solutions, economic solutions, educational solutions, religious solutions, political solutions, and ultimately all of them fall to the ground because the grass withers, the flowers fade, and we are, we are grass, hopes only last as long as the people who have them, if, if that long. And nothing changes. And nothing is ultimately settled. And nothing is ultimately solved. But in the middle of that, Lord, you would stand as a beacon for us. You are our rock. You are indestructible. You are eternal. You are immortal. Your word is solid and forever true. Your promises will not fail. Your strength to perform them will never fade. Your intellect will never diminish. The light of your life just grows brighter and brighter in our eyes. The better we get to know you. Oh, thank you for that today. Lord, strengthen us that we would set our hope upon you. Strengthen us, Lord, <coughs> Excuse me, that we would set our hope on you. We think of people in our own lives who just really struggle with that sense of hope. They are under the pile from illness. <coughs> Excuse me. They're struggling with unmet expectations and fears. Their future, they don't have any confidence in a, in a future at all. And we don't want to be arrogant, but may we have the confidence of our faith in you. May we have the, the solidity of our hope in you. May we be someone that can reach out and love them and help them know Jesus. Oh, Lord, would you use us in that way? Would you hear us as in the quietness of these moments, we lift up people and needs that are of particular concern to us now. Hear us, O oh Lord, we ask.
praise you, O oh Lord, and we thank you that we can bring our cares and our concerns to you because you are such a caring Father. We commit them to you now. And would you use us as we would be your servants even this coming week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writes of this little church that uh, seems to have been one of his favorites. It was the, one of the earliest letters written in the New Testament. That and Galatians and James kind of vie for that, uh, that role. Um, but he writes this very young fellowship of, of growing, joyful believers. And he writes in verse 2, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor and Bible teacher Greg Laurie describes very simply how he came to know Christ. He says this, I became a Christian because I admired the Christians in my high school, on my high school campus, people whom I know. They were people whom I saw. I admired them from a distance as I watched them because they had something that I wanted in the quality of their life. You see, when a Christian walks with God, it should be the most attractive thing to a not yet believer. The Lord has planned for you and me to work in our daily lives to display him. To display the light, the life, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ to others. But what exactly does that look like? How do you know you are? And if you are, you're growing in it. How do you know if maybe you're not and, and you need to grow in it? Well, what does it look like? It looks like what people were gossiping about Thessalonians, that Paul was hearing from people away from Thessalonica. Um, what were they seeing? Well, I believe what they were seeing is what Paul has just remembered in the verses that we have just read. Their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that was their public evident reputation, and it preceded them in the best way. We've been considering these three aspects of life. I'm calling them core aspects of what it means to be authentic. Being authentic with a, a work of faith, being authentic with a labor of love, and this morning, being authentic with an enduring hope. You see, these, this is a strong foundation of life. It really sums up everything in terms of the practical expression of our Christian life. And isn't it not what the world desperately needs to see from us in a faithful and true, authentic kind of a way? You know, these three words, faith, hope, and love, this isn't the only place they're mentioned. You know them most obviously from 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now, these three things abide, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. That's probably your go-to verse when you think about these three. But let me share a couple of other passages with you, because you'll get the idea of how significant they are. In Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, Through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all God's people. 
The faith and the love spring up from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Faith, hope, and love, the characteristics of a vibrant, thriving Christian life, and other people seeing it and bearing fruit and making a difference. Authentic faith. Authentic faith, faith that works. It is not creeds. It's not doctrines. It's not knowledge. It's not content. Now, it's certainly based on those things, but, but true faith that Paul is talking about here is faith that works. It is faith anchored in the scriptures which do not fail. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes this, all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is faith in God's unchanging word that produces a good life in us, a life of obedience, service to the Lord, authentic faith. You and I as believers are to be people known with a faith that is authentic because it works out the truth of God's word. Authentic love. Authentic love is not just feelings. It's not just sentiment. It's not just heart kind of things. Authentic love is love that Paul says labors. It sweats. It toils. And it's how you and I serve Christ intensely because we love him so deeply. It's how we serve our brothers and sisters in Christ because we want to love each other deeply from the heart. It's, it's how we serve those who people who don't know Christ yet because we want them to know the Lord Jesus. You can't just truth people into a relationship with Christ preaching doctrine and expecting them to believe it. You can't just truth them into it. You have to have truth that is empowered and enriched by a deep, deep love. That is the example of Christ. As John wrote in the first gospel, grace and truth come through Jesus. But to that foundation of authentic faith and authentic love, Paul adds what we would call the third authentic hope. Hope would be the, the eternal flame, it's the fire, it is the energy, it supplies the motivation, and as it endures and the fire does not go out, that faith and that love continue to be lived uh, in spite of everything that's taking place. And so I want to talk about hope for a little bit right now. Hope has a root and hope has a fruit. The root of hope is something that we would call an objective reality. It is the truth. And the root of hope is Christ. The root of hope is Christ. The foundation of our faith is Christ. The example of our love is Christ. The root of our hope is Christ. All that he is, all that he has done, all that he will do, that is what we hope in. That is what we rest in on. That is what we count on. That is what we lean on. YouTube, on my playlist this week, I have a song. It's called My Hope is in the Lord. It's a different one than we sometimes sing at church. One of the slides is a slide full of Jesus. It is a slide full of his names, his titles. There are almost 30 different words, and that just scratches the surface of the words that we could use to describe Jesus. Good shepherd, savior, king, way, redeemer, lord, brother, friend. Jesus, the person, he is our hope. Our hope is anchored to him as a person in his character, in his names. A friend of mine was talking recently about someone who is very dear to him, who's really struggling in their faith right now, struggling with issues of John 14, 6, specifically, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 
And that's a very inclusive statement as far as who comes to the Father, but it also puts up a barrier and it's exclusive because people who don't come to Jesus, Jesus is saying they don't come to the Father. And and sometimes people really have a hard time with that statement because it may separate out people that they care about very, very deeply. It is a verse that demonstrates Jesus is the only way, and that is a hard question. But my question is, well, who else is there? Who else is qualified to bring us into a relationship with the Father? If not Jesus, then there's no one. Who else became the Lamb of God who gave his life for the sin of the world? Who else suffered on the cross experiencing the wrath of God and punishment for our sin? Who else died and was buried? Who else was raised to a glorious resurrected life and exalted in heaven waiting to come back as our king? Who else is like that. There, there is nobody else. And for all of those reasons, to look at Jesus, he is our hope. He is the one that we look at with joy and confidence and longing. There are some people, I'm sure, in your life that the more you get to know them, the less you want to know them. Well, you be assured that as you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you get to know him, the more you realize you can never exhaust everything about him and you want to know him more and more and more. But it's not just knowing him. It's not just his names. It's not just his titles. He's not not just a man with a lot of letters behind his name. He is someone with a wonderful resume of life. He was before the beginning. He he created everything that is. But then he came to join us in a humble birth and a humble life. He made his life the innocent sacrifice and death for our sin, death on that cross for us, buried, resurrected, ascended, coming back. And the promise of what he gives to every person who believes in him. Our hope is his promise. And that is what many of you have received forgiveness of your sin 100% once for all through his death on the cross. No more sacrifices. It is finished. It is done. The hope, the promise that God has forgiven you now and that lasts forever. With that comes a cleansed heart, not just cleansed from the penalty, but from the guilt, from the stain, from, from the brokenness, the cleansed heart, the a purpose for life. Now, we, before we used to just live for ourselves, now we have the purpose of living for him and an eternal life. And not just an eternal life in this particular body, but a brand new body that will not die. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, here it is with the resurrection of the dead. This body is sown perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Flesh and blood, this body does not inherit the kingdom of God. This perishable cannot inherit the perishable, imperishable, but we will be changed. We will be transformed. Friends, that is the objective hope that is, that is our promise in Christ. And so for these Thessalonians, as they endured in hope, it was not simply hopeful feelings or wishful thinking. They had a content that they had united their lives to, they had joined themselves to, given to them through the Lord Jesus. This objective hope in, in whose we are, that is, we belong to Christ and the object of hope into where we are going, and that is with him. And then that really becomes the foundation of a strong, strong life, the objective hope. But hope also has a, an objective part, a subjective part, and that is that there is the content of hope, and then there is the act of hoping, the attitude of hoping. You see, you can have all of the objective hope just standing out there, but until you engage in it in your own life, claiming it, trusting it, relying upon it. It's just its just content out there. It is the act of hoping. So as, as faith looks back to what Jesus did for us and love looks around to the people, is faith looking around? All of us, faith, hope is faith looking forward to what Jesus has promised to do for us. The world has hopes. 
The world has promises. The world has dreams. The world has plans. And it seems with every election cycle, they change completely back and forth. Or they end in the death or the retirement or, or you know, the, the uh, diminishing of the people that are trying to make them happen, the weaknesses. The desires for something better that never actually seem to come to fruition and you get tired. That's really the world's hope. It's hopefulness, it's wishful thinking, and it's so often discouraged wringing of hands and despair. The world is not a place of hope. The Christian hope looks at what we just looked at, the promise of God to be who he is, to do what he said, to accomplish what he said, excuse me, and, and that is a gift for us through our faith in Christ. And so one, someone has divine Christian hope as this. It is a present vision of a promised good in the future. Present vision of this promised good that we have in the future. Confidence, assurance, the certainty that it will come as God has promised it. And so we wait. We wait. And Christian hope waits with peace, with peace in our hearts because God's in control and nothing is going to shake him off his throne. He's in control of the macro picture of everything that's going on in the world. He's in control of the micro picture of the little things that are going on in your daily life. All of the joys, all of the struggles, all of the, the sadness and the unmet expectations, the, the relationships. He is the Lord over all of those things and he's working in all of those things and he's with you guiding you, providing for you. That's your hope, and he's not going to let you go. That hope shows itself in fears that are able to be tempered because God wins, and he does win. That hope can show itself in a sense of stability and confidence. So many times in the Psalms, it talks about trusting in the Lord, and I will not be ashamed. What that ultimately means is that I will never be shown to be a fool for having placed my trust in God. At the end of time, I will have been shown to have made the best decision. I, I will never be ashamed. It shows itself in security. Our hope is not that I can hold on to the Lord. Well, it's important for me to hold on to the Lord. It, it does require my effort in terms of if, if I want to thrive and I want to grow in life, it's a two-way street, but it doesn't rest on my ability to hold on to the Lord. I liken it to carrying one of my children when they were little, and, uh, and they would hang on to my neck for dear life. But do you know who was holding? I was holding. Because I had my arm around them, I had my arm under their little butt, and I was holding on tight to them. didn't matter that they were holding on. They could have let go, and they could have flung themselves. And I had them. Our hope rests in this anchor that Jesus holds you. Not that you're holding him. He holds you. And so this hope can give to us a sense of anticipation as far as how we experience every day. If there's one place of anticipation, it's a very tragic place, but it's Jeremiah and Lamentations. Lamentations is Jeremiah's song of grief over the utter destruction of his people. His people were evicted from the land. So many thousands and thousands of people were slaughtered. People were taken off into exile, and Jeremiah himself was kidnapped and taken off away from where the Lord wanted him to be. As Jeremiah writes in the middle of it, these are words that become one of our favorite hymns. Lamentations 3, beginning with verse 19. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. He's never going to forget the pain that he saw with his eyes. He's never going to forget the hole in his heart, the ache, as he watched his nation be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar did a thorough job of that. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. 
Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. Hope shows itself in a renewed perspective and a new, renewed outlook. And that even in the midst of the darkest days and the hardest things in life, before we have any answers, we have the Lord who prepares the day for us, whose mercies are new every morning. We sing the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. What a wonderful song of hope. Hope shows itself in enduring. Hope, by definition, lasts. Hope, by definition, lasts. And as I think about that, I want to take a step back for just a second. You know, we've spoken about faith, hope, and love, and I've shown you how that's a big theme in the New Testament. But what if that's not actually the focal point, at least for Paul here? He doesn't simply say, I remember before our God your faith, your love, and your hope. What if the focal point is the words that modify that? What if he's looking at the Thessalonians, he's saying, and I mention you before God, remembering your work. I remember your labor and you are enduring. And he's looking at that and he's look, and it's maybe faith is the modifier and love is the modifier and hope is the modifier because the people are working for the Lord. They are loving each other. They are enduring. And that's really what Paul is commenting on. I mean, you can't see faith unless you see the work that faith is accomplishing. You don't see love unless you see the labor that is engaged in, the hard, hard work of caring. What is endurance? if it isn't enduring. And so hope that isn't enduring isn't actually hope at all. Hope, there is hope and endurance. If there's no endurance, you know, you don't see it together. So, so the triad is yes, faith, hope, and love, but the triad is also hard work, tireless, laborious effort and endurance. And for you and I as Christians, that is what people will actually see, we just need to let them know the source. That that work is not trying to fe impress people. It's not out of fear that we're losing our salvation or anything. It's not to puff up. It is our trust in God in a changed life lived for him. Labor, toil, ceaseless, not shirking, not grudgingly, not complainingly, not you know, trying to, you know, show I'm better than somebody else, but rather love for Christ, love for my fellow Christians, love for other people that is ready to lay down my life for them, that is ready to sacrifice for them that labor, enduring in the face of tremendous opposition, in the face of persecution, in the face of hardship, in the face of stumbles, in the face of death persevering, standing fast. All of that is the opposite of a few people in Scripture. It's the opposite of John Mark, who, as you read in Acts chapter 13, was an accompanier of Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. And after their first major stop, where there was persecution and opposition, John Mark hightailed it back to Jerusalem. He couldn't take it anymore, and so he left. Now, he has a great story. He was restored. He wrote the gospel that bears his name of Mark, and he became one of Paul's most trusted and dependable servants. But he did not endure. He did not have a hope that endured. He turned around in the opposite direction. Have you ever done that? Maybe not in such a big way, but it's very easy for us to, to abandon the course because we're afraid. Well, there's another man who was even worse, and that was uh, Demas. Demas, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, Demas left. 
You know, he had been one of Paul's accompaniers. He had been uh, along with him on the journey. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, no, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, Demas left because he loved the pleasures of the world. Um, he left. In 2 Timothy 4, another place, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. I have watched people's faith get shipwrecked because they went down some kind of faith rabbit hole or they, they went after some preacher or teacher who sounded so exciting to them, but that person led them away from an authentic faith in Christ. Um, and that's a very, very tragic thing. Their faith did not endure. Other examples as well in scripture, endurance is the opposite of that. And it, it seems evident from the season of COVID that churches have gone through a sifting. There are people who have left and, and there are people who aren't really paying any attention anymore. Um, there are people for whom this just got to be too hard. And so there was a sifting. Jesus in Matthew 24, 13 said it very strikingly. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Paul had every confidence in these Thessalonians. And I think he would like that confidence to be yours and mine. That our hope in Christ will enable us to persevere and endure. Now, what, is that, what does that endurance look like? Uh, one of the ways that endurance looks like is in from Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not grow, go give up. Enduring is continuing to do the work of the Lord, even if you don't see the fruit, even if you don't see what's happening. I have a friend who has a beautiful garden, or at least had a beautiful garden. They've done it for several years now. It's probably at least 20 by 20, and it's full of beautiful plants all summer long. This was not a good summer. Their tomatoes, they had, they had rows of tomato plants, and I think she said they had four tomatoes the whole summer. Their squash died early after the, uh, you know, all of the rain that we had. I don't know what else is coming, but they've pulled up half of their garden already because it's, it's just done. Does that mean that next summer they're not going to plant? Of course not. They're, they're going to fertilize. They're going to get the soil ready and they're going to plant. They'll water. They'll fertilize. They'll take care of things because they are going to endure. They're going to persevere. And so the setbacks of, of a year, that's life. And in due time, you'll reap. But if you stop planting, you're, you're not going to harvest anything. You can't do that. That doesn't, that doesn't work in that way. Someone was sharing with me yesterday, we live knowing that we don't know when the fruit is going to come. Every once in a while, I'll get a call from someone and they'll remind me of a conversation that happened years ago um, that I didn't even think anything about. And all of a sudden it bore fruit. Maybe you've had somebody do that a relationship that you've had that maybe you hadn't really seen anything and all of a sudden it bears fruit. We don't know. So we endure so that we can reap the harvest. James von Moltke's story is told by Oz Guinness in his excellent book, The Call. James was of a noble family. He was 26 in Germany when uh, Hitler came to power. And like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of his contemporaries, God called him to stay in Germany. Many were leaving when they had the chance to escape what they knew was going to be an awful future. But he decided to stay, and uh, he wanted to make a difference for Christ. He was a devout follower of the Lord Jesus. He ended up doing it in a very, very unusual way. He actually was drafted into the Abwehr, which was the military intelligence, and he was in the highest echelons of Nazi power. But in the ways that he could overtly, he would try to delay things and slow things that he knew would be very damaging. And in covert ways, he would try to provide warnings for people. There were villages that he was able to save all of the Jews in those villages because he would send out a warning and people were able to escape because he was a Christian and he was serving the Lord in the midst of the, the evil empire. 
Well, unfortunately, he was betrayed in 1944. He was tried in a public court. He was sentenced to death. And as he was standing before the prosecution, he said, I stand here not as a Protestant. I stand here not as a big landowner, not as a German, not as a Prussian, but I stand here as a Christian, nothing else. He was Christ's man up to the end. His hope was enduring. As he communicated with his wife in what probably was his final letter, he writes, everything became clear. Is this my hour is dawning? He was facing a certain death. It was coming very, very soon. He said, I would gladly accept a new task from God. If God had more things for me to do, I would really be glad to do them. But the task for which God has made me is done. The earthly life to which God has called me has finished its task. And James von Moltke endured to the end because of the hope of God's plan in his life because of the hope of God's promise, to endure in this way is to finish well. He knew his life had been in God's hands, and he knew in a, just a moment he would be in God's presence. One of the promises, it's not specifically written this way in Scripture, but certainly this expresses the truth of Scripture. You will not die one moment too soon, nor can you keep your life one moment longer, and God is ready for it. But because of that, we have hope of being in his hands. It is the endurance of hope in which we live. It is the endurance of hope through which we can die. Why do we know we can die? Because that's really the end of hope for so many people. You know what happened when Christ died on the cross? Well, a lot of things happened when Christ died on the cross. But as the great Puritan John Owen wrote it this way, death died on the cross. He wrote this marvelous book, The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. I want you to think about that for a minute. The death of death in the death of Christ. What is death? It's not just the cessation of our existence here. But death is God's curse on our sin. That is what death is. Back when he, he from, spoke his curse back in Genesis chapter 3, death, and that is the fruit of the curse. When Jesus died on the cross, that was the, the culmination and the epitome, the completion, the fullness of death as the curse. Jesus was cursed on the cross. That was his death. And when he died, because he satisfied God's wrath, death died. He killed it in his death. And that's why it couldn't hold him, because death died. The death of death does not apply. The death of death applies to everybody who has come to Christ. It's, it's another reason that Jesus is the one that we follow. In John 11, Jesus said this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me shall never die. One of the reasons that our hope can endure it's because the only thing that happens to a believer is this earth suit stops. That's all. The earth suit, the earth suit stops. And, and when we close our eyes in death here, we open them to the presence of the Lord. As Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Not clothed in our, earth, our final dwelling yet in a way that's beyond what I completely understand, but to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord for the believer. Herein then becomes our motivation. For everyone who trusts in Christ, death died on the cross. But for everyone who does not trust in Christ, death is with them. And when they die, they die themselves. 
And the good news that you and I have is that Jesus offers release from that. He offers the forgiveness. He offers the grace. He offers the eternal life. And for the Thessalonians, that message was worth working for their faith. That message was worth laboring for in their love. And that message was worth enduring for even if they died. And as we get on into 1 Thessalonians, we'll see that some of them had died. And that raised a whole raft of questions for them as far as understanding believers and death. Friends, the authenticity of your faith, the authenticity of your hope, the authenticity of your love. You and I are advertisements for what is authentic in our lives. Is it what we want it to be? Is the authenticity that people see as they look at you, the authenticity of a faith that is serving Christ and working and people see you as his servant? Is the authenticity in your life the costly joyful love that you have for Christ and for other people, both believers and those not yet? Is it authentic because you're enduring? The struggles of your life don't dissuade you. They don't turn you away. You are persevering. You are staying until the vessel that you have has completed the task on earth and you have endured for eternal life. That's something to live for. And that gives people hope. Let's pray. Lord, your word is rich. And we thank you for it. Your word helps us live. And we might live for Christ because of our faith, that uh, the works of faith that you have created for us, we receive and we are so glad because we're actually serving your purposes now and making a difference, not our own. Love, we love people and we want them to come to know you. We want to serve them with all of our heart. We want to use who you're making us to be to bless people and to bless you. And we want to endure because of the promise that you've made that is unshakable. We want to endure. But Lord, maybe there's someone here today that that's not a reality for yet. Maybe there's someone listening today who has not yet turned from their own throne of life, as the Thessalonians did, to serving Christ, waiting for him to come back. I pray that he, I pray that she would be able to use a prayer like this to say, Jesus, now that I've heard more about who you are and what you've done, I admit my need. I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord, and I want my life to count for you. I want it to be seen in the faith and the hope and the love of a maturing believer. Take me. I am yours. If that was your prayer today, would you let me know? Because I'd like to pray further with you and just help you take some first steps in growing in that direction. Because that'll bring glory to God and his goodness and a rich experience in your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning as we have continued to consider authentic faith, hope, and love, excuse me. I just pray that the Lord will strengthen you this week. And if you haven't already, um, take a listen to the uh, songs on the playlist. I know they'll encourage you. Uh, share them with a friend. If you, uh, if you ever wanted, if you know, maybe you know someone that one of the songs would minister to, you know, share them. That's a way that you can introduce Jesus to them. And uh, don't forget thinking about Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child. And uh, thank you for uh, your faithful support of God's word through the sending of your offerings. God bless you. Goodbye.